Today, we are covering projection and process de decomposition. So these are methods through which we can take a kind of large abstract CHP specification and break it apart into smaller and smaller specifications that we can then implement via handshake expansion and reshuffling that we covered uh, on Monday. Uh, to start, we need to come up with an understanding for kind of program behavior and how that affects our ability to break up the program and maintain functional correctness. And so there are a couple of ways of representing program behavior, uh, and we're just going to start with kind of the, the basic approach using uh, two-phase CHP. So we've got a program specification in two-phase CHP for a source on the left, a uh, weak condition half buffer, or just a half buffer really on the in the middle here, and then a sync on the right. And so we're just gonna work through kind of the sequence of operations that it goes through during execution. Uh, so on in it, we have, you know, we start at kind of the beginning of each of these loops uh, with a program counter uh, at the beginning there. And so the first thing that happens, that is able to happen, is the set phase of the send on A. And that is because uh, the middle process here is waiting for uh, that send on A to happen. And then the end process here is waiting for a send on B. And so they're both uh, kind of uh, paused, waiting for a signal from its environment. So the only, uh, the only process that isn't paused waiting for a signal from its environment is the source. So the first event that happens is the set phase on that send of A, and that enables the uh, set phase of the receive on A, and it enables the, uh, um, so once the set phase on the receive on A executes, that enables the reset phase on the send of A, right? So we've We've executed the set phase of the send. We are we have now executed the set phase of the receive, and then we can execute the reset phase of the uh, send. All right, and so now we've got uh, two program counters actively walking through their uh, their their processes, their process specifications. So the next thing that we can do. Now that we've received the token on A, this uh, process can move on to its next uh, step, which is sending, it's, it's the set phase on the send on B, right? And so that can execute, and that can execute regardless of what's happening in the source here. And the source cannot continue because it's waiting for the reset phase uh, on the receive of A. Okay, so once that happens, uh, the next thing that can happen is the set phase of the receive on B. And so we execute that. And then uh, we can move forward with the middle process to the uh, reset phase of the receive on A. And so now the, the reset phase and the receive on A waits for the reset phase of the, of the send on A. It waits for the set phase of uh, the send on B because of this semicolon. Uh, and as a result of the synchronization in the set phase of the send on B, it also waits for the reset phase, or sorry, the set phase of the receive on B. Does that make sense so far? Okay. And so we can keep kind of walking through this program, generating this kind of execution trace, right? And so we execute the set phase of the send on A again, right? And then we repeat. So reset phase of the send on B, reset phase of the receive on B, set phase of the receive on A, and so on. And so that will just keep going into infinity right? Basically, as long as the chip is on and powered. So if you look at this system as a whole, right, this is called an event rule system. You've got an event, which is the transition. You've got the rule, which is the arcs. We've got two kinds of rules. Um, so 
The first kind is the uh, syntactic rules. So these are derived from the syntax within each process. These, you know, these are the composition operators, specifically the semicolons, right? A dictating sequence end, right? And so uh, if you were to remove all this, the semicolons and just make them uh, parallel operators, then uh, all of these syntactic rules would just disappear. And you'd be left with just the synchronization rules. So the synchronization rules are derived from the communication between a send port and a receive port in a given phase. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Uh, so together those form the event rule system and uh, we can start thinking about uh, you know, our system behavior in terms of this event rule system. So the next thing that we wanna talk about is Slack, right? We have covered you know, half buffer and full buffer and uh, no Slack sequential. And so we haven't really talked about what that means yet. So let's let's do that now, right? And so this system, uh, you've got some kind of like a vague sense that this system is, uh, you've got like a half buffer in here uh, and you've got a source and, and a sync. So you're, you've got some vague uh, sense that the Slack here is maybe 0.5, right? And so if we look um, at uh, an individual communication between two processes, you've got, let's, let's take a look at A, right? So you've got, in our event rule system, you've got the set phase of the send on A, the set phase of the receive on A, the reset phase of the send on A, and the reset phase of the receive on A, right? So you can see this kind of dependency chain between processes, right? From here out to the buffer and back to the source. And on the other side uh, with the sync, there's a similar uh, kind of uh, feedback, right? There's a similar uh, kind of back and forth between the processes from the send on B to the receive in the other process and then back to the buffer. And so we can kind of walk, walk this relationship from the send on A out to the receive on B and back, right? And what that gets us is this kind of relationship where we're going from send all the way out to receive on B in the sync and then all the way back to the send on A. And so if we take away this buffer in the middle and we just look at these relationships between the source and the sink, then we can get a sense of the slack in the whole system, right? And so in the previous system, when we were just looking at one channel communication action, uh, we were seeing that the number of communication actions between say uh, a set phase on the send and then uh, the, you know, the feedback is zero, right? There's nothing in between here. Whereas in the full system, now we've got a communication action in between, right? And because this is two phase, that communication action represents half of the communication, right? And so that means that this system has a slack of 0.5. Now we can extend upon this, right? If we look at, you know, what would happen if our kind of relationships were forward, if we added another buff, half buffer into the system, we'd get a slack of one, right? Because we get another half communication uh, in between the feedback, you know, the, the, the initial send and the, the uh, kind of acknowledge of that send, right? And then we can kind of extend that on into infinity, however we'd like, right? So if there's, infinite slack, then we can communicate infinitely on the channel A without ever worrying about getting blocked by, you know, not having space in the system, right? Not having space for tokens. Similarly, we, you know, looking back at our earlier example, a slack of zero is there's no, you know, we, we have to, there's no room on the channel, right? We always have to get a uh, response from the receiver before we can continue on with our protocol. 
So given this understanding of Slack, uh, we can start to think about when it is okay to add Slack into the system. Like when can we start adding buffers in between two processes on a channel? And that is called Slack elasticity. So basically, if we can add buffers uh, or Slack to a channel and maintain functional correctness, right? It doesn't change the behavior of the overall system. Then we call that channel Slack elastic. And you can find this pretty well described in uh, Roget's paper, Slack Elasticity in Concurrent Computing. And uh, it's listed down here. So the, the next question is like, how do we determine whether a channel is Slack Elastic? And so we have our system, right? That's given by the specification down here. We have one process that sends on X and then sends on Y, right? And then we have another process which just checks, all right, is there a token on X? If so, receive on X, then receive on Y. But if the token on Y arrives first, then flag an error, right? And without Slack on X, the, this system will operate correctly. Right, we'll, we'll first send on X. The, uh, the first process there then has to wait for the receiver to receive the value on X. And so uh, this guard is evaluated and then we receive the value on X. Then we send on Y. And because we're already at this semicolon, we are guaranteed to then receive on Y. And so we'll always operate correctly without Slack on channel X. But if we add Slack to channel X, then what happens is we've got this extra possible behavior where we send on X, then we, you know, the buffer receives on X. And so this first process is allowed to then continue and send on Y. At which point the second process will evaluate this probe on Y and go to the error case. Right, and so we, we've added the second behavior by adding Slack onto channel X. And so when we look at the event rule system as a whole, right, these get kind of combined together into two possible outcomes. Then what happens is we've got this non-deterministic choice between the two probes, right? Which one, whichever one arrives first will, will determine whether or not the system errors, right? And so we've, we've added behaviors into the system. The old behavior that was there, the correct behavior still exists and is still possible as long as X arrives first, right? Um, but we've got this extra error case then. So if we want to, uh, fit, you know, what this means ultimately is that anytime we add Slack, we are relaxing synchronization rules. Right, so if you go back to that picture where we're, we're adding Slack to the system, right here, we are relaxing these synchronizations between the channel communication actions, right? We're moving them downstream, right? And anytime you relax synchronization rules, synchronization constraints, you add new behaviors to the system. And so these are described in level one, monotonicity and theorem two, increasing Slack in this paper. Right. Okay. So how do we know that we're about to add a new behavior to the system? Um, if you look at the uh, receiving process, right? Anytime we have a process specification, the only uh, syntax in that specification that is dependent on program state is the guard in a conditional statement or in a wait, right? Uh, and those guards explicitly sample the program state, right? Every other syntax uh, is largely a uh, method to add uh, syntax rules to the specification and doesn't really look at the program state, right? 
And so that means that, uh, you know, when you're, when you're looking at events, uh, events directly affect the program state and relaxing synchronization constraints increases the set of events that can occur in parallel with a given guard. So you're, you're increasing the state space that is available for that guard to be sampling. Right. Uh, and that means that, you know, by relaxing those, those constraints, those guards may no longer be mutually exclusive. They may no longer be stable, right? You may be breaking your specification. And so if you want to see if a process is slack elastic, you have to look at the guards in that process. Um, and so if increasing slack only relaxes synchronization constraints, you know, increasing slack only relaxes synchronization constraints, uh, if a guard is guaranteed mutually exclusive and stable as a result of only syntactic constraints, then it will be unaffected by adding slack. Does that make sense? Okay. So, uh, if we want to identify whether it's okay to add slack, we have to look at the guards. We have to make sure that they're only affected by some tactic constraints, and then we're good to go. So now that we've got this idea of slack elasticity, we can think about how do we break apart processes and then add slack to kind of desynchronize them and allow them to operate independently, right? Without without these strict synchronizations. And so that's when we get to process decomposition. So in process decomposition, we've got this function, f, in, inside a process. And we want to take this function, whatever it is, and pull it out of the process into its own process. Right? And so what we do is we add a communication action, a, in the original process, and then we create a new process that receives on A and then executes the function and then does the reset phase on A. And so what that does is it ensures that this process, you know, the original process will not continue until the function is completed. And it ensures that this second process, the new one that we've added, will not start until the first process gets to A. At the moment, this doesn't communicate data or anything like that. It's just the synchronization. It's just the, the composition, right? So what we're doing here is we're taking a syntactic rule and we're turning it into a synchronization rule, right? And so in a way, again, this is about relaxing those, those rules, those constraints, uh, in order to desynchronize the system. Um, and you can kind of break this down even further, right? You can, uh, recognizing that the set phase of the receive on A is, is two phases of the four phase communication. You can put one phase at the beginning and you can put the other, the other, uh, three phases at the end, right? So you don't have to explicitly do two and two, you can do one and three, depending upon, uh, you know, as long as your protocol is passive, basically. Okay. If you want to communicate data, then you can do so, right? So if your function receive, you know, uh, uses the value of X to, uh, to execute, then you simply send that value along your channel, right? And in the receive, you receive that value, uh, X, you know, F of X uses X and then, uh, you're good to go, right? And if you want to send data, right, if your f of x then produces a value y, then you need a second channel or you can use an exchange channel. We will talk about exchange channels in module four in advanced topics. For now, we'll use a second channel. And so we've got a send on A, sending the value x, and then we've got a receive on B, receiving the value y. Right. And so the, the process that we've added uh, receives X from A, 
executes the function, setting y using x, and then sends the result back on b. OK. Does that make sense so far? Cool. All right. So that brings us to projection. Projection takes advantage of two things. It takes advantage of process decomposition to break apart a process into multiple communicating processes. And then it takes advantage of slack elasticity to entirely separate those two processes. Let's look at this. Okay, so we've got our process. We've got to receive on A, we're receiving X. We've got to send on B, sending X. We've got to receive on, y, uh, on C, receiving Y. And then we've got to ascend on D, sending Y. Now, A and B and C and D don't have any data dependencies. Right, they are, um, you can kind of already see that we could separate these two and the only thing that would change is the synchronization between A, B and C and D. So how do we formally prove that? Well, the first step we do is we take A and B and we break that out using process decomposition, right? So we, uh, this is the second variant where we have the, the uh, first phase of the four phase communication action on the left, and then we have the other three phases on the right. And so we've got, this is a data list send on X, and then a data list receive on X, it's just there to handle synchronization. And then we can do the same thing for C and D. So we take C and D and we break it out into its own process. So now we've got two separate processes, one for A and B, one for C and D. And we've got a third process that is really only there to sequence, to sequence the other two, right? So it's creating sequencing constraints on the other two processes. And what we've done is we've taken, again, we've taken those syntactic ordering constraints, sequencing constraints, and we've turned them into uh, uh, synchronization constraints over channels. Okay. So the next thing to observe here is that as long as X and Y are slack elastic, then we can let the slack on X and Y grow to infinity. Okay. Which means that the sequencing process can run ahead infinitely after reset, right? And we can get an infinite number of tokens queued up on X and Y. And as a result, all of the sequencing constraints between these two processes effectively disappear, right? And so, in effect, what happens is we can just get rid of the sequencer altogether, and we're left with our two independent processes. And so that is ultimately the uh, method which we can use to project basically two processes um, into uh, a part, right? And, and so the name projection ultimately comes from this idea of uh, selecting a group of variables that are kind of independent of each other when it comes to data dependencies and just putting one group of variables in one process and the other group of variables in another process. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I recommend you go and look up the uh, derivation of the first asynchronous microprocessor uh, because they go through that process rigorously. I can post this on the course web page. Here it is, the design of the first asynchronous microprocessor. Uh, and so they start with this 
specification here, and they so this is the specification for a like a whole processor, right? Written in CHP, and you can tell it's you know pretty short actually, because CHP is a really abstract language, right? Um, and so they they take take it through step by step, decomposing it into different processes, right? And they walk you through that decomposition one step at a time. 